Well, thanks for coming to our presentation. We only saw two people leave, so I'd say that's a win for us. Um, we, uh, our, our presentation is titled Tools Using Tools, an Autobiography. And Sam, take it away. <laughs> Uh, okay, for those that don't know, I'm Sam. I worked under uh, Jim this summer, and I'm a recent graduate from Auburn. I attended my thesis, and the projects that I focused on this summer uh, were using the drone and the 3D printer, but John and I pretty much co-collaborated on all the projects. So my name is John Bridgman. I am a recent graduate from Tulane University in New Orleans, um, and, and with, through the USIP program, I worked uh, are focused on the RC planes and LiDAR scanning. So we both worked on a handful of projects this summer. We didn't have one specific focus. And the first four projects highlighted in red are what we're going to talk about today. But we also worked on uh, building and trying to complete some GPS campaign kits to send out. And those kind of go all over when uh, PIs uh, put in a request for them. And then we also organized and inventoried the warehouse this summer. Uh, we're not going to talk much about that, but it's something that we feel strongly about. We spent a lot of time doing it. <laughs> so the first project that uh, I worked on, which spanned pretty much all eight weeks, was getting together the 3D, 3DR drone uh, to send out two PIs for structure for motion data acquisition. And so we had one drone, uh, and we ended up getting a second one, and so completing those two kits so that they were ready to go out, being able to create a workflow so that a PI that didn't have any experience using a drone could set it up, fly it, get the data they needed, take that data off, um, and then do what they want with it. So here I am with the drone, I'm really happy that I didn't crash it. Uh, it's pretty small, so easy to take places, uh, super accessible, it was easy for me to learn. And this is just a cool picture from the Boulder Bravo Airport looking towards the flat irons uh, from the drone itself. And then this is me also not crashing it, which is pretty great. So some finished products from this was the, uh, the write-up, which is about eight pages. I wanted to keep it pretty short so it was easy to get through, but informative enough to kind of uh, troubleshoot and to have resources to go find troubleshooting. Um, because while it's not difficult to fly, if you don't do things in the right order, um, it, it won't work, and there's a lot of like weird little nuanced stuff about it. Um, and then we have a bunch of videos. So this is a video of me also not crashing it. Uh, I didn't crash it at all. It was something I was really worried about. And uh, it was pretty easy to fly. Uh, John's going to talk about the RC plane, which is a lot harder to fly. So I'm pretty happy that I got the, uh, the easier of the two. Uh, I had the least amount of experience flying things. Um, and so this is a super fun project for me and, and kind of being able to play with this at the airport was, uh, was a treat this summer. So this entire uh, setup is for Structure for Motion and Structure for Motion, a little bit about it, uh, it's modeling. So what's really cool about this is that you can kind of take pictures from anywhere. So the Coliseum uh, in Rome is a classic example where a bunch of tourists have taken hundreds of thousands of pictures and using algorithms, you can throw them into a program You'll get point clouds, and from that point cloud, you can create a model. And so it's really accessible to people who don't have access to really expensive equipment, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So the Rome Coliseum is a pretty good example, but we can also use it for geologic applications, taking pictures of outcrops, being able to model them in the classroom. You can do structural geology or geomorphology from this. Uh, the possibilities are, are pretty vast. And then another example is uh, one of our buildings, which I'm uh, pretty sure Keith took. Uh, so this, this is just like something fun to look at. Uh, this is structure for motion of our building uh, from an aerial point of view. So I also worked on using the 3D printer as auxiliary to be able to uh, print stuff for the drone. So this is the 3D printer printing some new little feet for the drone. Uh, this was done to raise the elevation of the drone so that when it lands, you don't smash the camera into the ground. Uh, I tested some plastics, trying to figure out like what was going to be durable and not brittle and break when it lands, uh, different heights. Uh, and so some finished products from that was this purple foot that I ended up breaking two days ago. And so <laughs> that's not a good one to use. Uh, so far, this has been the best one. Uh, and then these were them all together. The two on the right are actually ones that were stock that were sent to us with the drones. And the two on the left are ones that we printed trying to test different heights. 
Uh, and then we also use 3D printer for other applications. So the three things on the top are for the campaign kits, and then the bracket on the bottom is uh, for other kits that go out. And so this is something fun to learn how to do for myself, uh, but is also super applicable to the drone and to a lot of other things that we do in the warehouse. So uh, moving on to the RC planes, the drones are a really good way to make science really accessible to a wide range. They're portable, they're relatively cheap, um, but an even cheaper solution is our RC planes. And for the RC plane, uh, we decided to um, build it from a set. So we were given uh, just some foam and some fairly well, I don't know, some okay instructions on how to build it online. And we made, um, we used a lot of hot glue, we used a lot of soldering, and we made the wings, we made the fuselage, we cut some stuff, we glued it back on because we cut it wrong. And we ended up um, having to balance and make it aerodynamic, which is actually kind of challenging when you're making a kit um, or seaplane. But it, um, we were able to fully uh, complete it. And the interesting part is that um, there's some more things you can do it. So while it is flight worthy at this point and it's been trimmed out and is aerodynamic, um, trim just meaning that it's not gonna wobble around on you and it'll fly straight. Uh, there's some potential to put some Arduinos um, on it and some satellite stuff so that it will be semi-autonomous and it'll take off and fly kind of circle in the air. So if you've never flown a plane before, really taking off is the hardest part. So you can kind of take control when it's already in the air. Um, and then you can put some cameras on it and you'd be able to do some more backyard or just maybe citizen science where you get some good photography, but it may not be um, stable enough or really high quality enough to do structure promotion. Um, but we do have a video of it flying on its maiden voyage. And as you can see, this wouldn't be the easiest thing to fly if you've never used it before. Um, but by the end of it, Sam was able to fly it around pretty competently up in the air and had a nice landing, much better than <laughs> that landing, which I had. Um, and also one of our uh, su supervisors, Keith, was able to fly it too. So we were able to prove that it was actually useful for more people. Um, and so LIDAR, which is another one of the geodetic survey um, kind of instruments we use, is the premium of all of these. It is uh, quite expensive and that can be really limiting, but you get a really high precision and accuracy with it. So you can get some pretty novel approaches to it or applications to it. So we um, use a Rigel uh, VZ400 and that's on the left. And you have to have reflectors that kind of, uh, that you have positioned so that you can connect all these different scans together. And we did multiple scans of the UNAFCO building. And this map might be a little hard to see, but what is happening is that there are, um, each of the scan locations is color coded and it's um, centralized with a corresponding line drawn to the reflector so that you can all, you can put them in to a program and connect all these scans together. And while we were doing this, Sam uh, scanned, I did a little bit of scanning and then we hung out. And while we were hanging out, I always thought I was good at uh, being able to tell like when weather was coming, because I was taller, close to the atmosphere. But we found out that Sam is way better at that and listens to weather forecasts. So Dylan and I got soaked as Sam very uh, wisely cleaned up stuff and went inside. But that's just one of the little mishaps we had. But some, for some of our finished products, um, here's a panorama of one of the areas we scanned. And after scanning it, you, we get a 2D reflectance um, panorama of that area. So the blue 
is no return. It's kind of sky, it's water, it's just stuff that's too close. And the black and grays are more the reflectance that you can map. And when you process that, it turns into a 3D point cloud. And that point cloud um, is what you use to really make the model um, of the building. And you take pictures of it, and you can um, color those each of those points. And some of the kind of artifacts you get from that is people separating from their body. So this is me, and I'm having the out-of-body experience right there. But that isn't really an application. Some of the interesting things that you can do with it is that in the Arctic, um, they will do a LIDAR scan of a seal. And if you have a high enough um, model of the seal and you know the average density uh, of that of seals generally, you can kind of uh, look at how healthy they are, how they're growing, and get a good idea of the seal population. So, so kind of wrapping all of the methods that we used up, uh, some of them are really strong in places as some are like very weak in places. So the drone is strongest for researchers because it's accessible. You can hike it up into a mountain if there's an outcrop that you can't get to with really heavy equipment. Uh, it is moderately expensive, so it's not the cheapest, it's not the most expensive, uh, but it's relatively easy to learn. Drones are relatively easy to fly, uh, they'll kind of hover in the air if you like panic, like I do when I'm flying the plane and I hand the controller back to John, I'm like, don't crash it. Um, so for sending them out to people who don't really have uh, experience in this area, they are the strongest. Um, and then we have the RC plane, which is easily the cheapest option, but it's probably uh, more difficult to learn depending on your background, uh, unless you are an avid plane flyer, and then it's totally up your alley. Uh, really good for citizen science because it is accessible by cost, um, and it definitely is more limited in the data acquisition. And the best thing to use uh, if you are trying to be really quantitative is the, the LIDAR scanning. So it's easily the most expensive, clocking in at dozens, ten, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on, I guess, what equipment you're using. Um, and it is difficult to operate, so it does take someone knowing it or running scans. Um, I've done it before and we still had difficulties, so sometimes it just doesn't want to work. Um, but it is dependent on a terrestrial location and it is really heavy. So if you have somewhere that you need to go that is really remote, uh, you can get it there. They've done it. Uh, they send it to, to look at seals so they can do it. But, um, but if you have something that's really specific, that's hard to get to, it's, uh, you know, the drone and the structure promotion may be a little bit more accessible. So they all have pros and cons. So in acknowledgement, we kind of realize that UNAVCO has a lot of tools. You just have to be able to use them. And we were able to use them because we had really great uh, mentors, thanks to Jim, uh, Keith, and Dylan. You guys were a lot of help and really helped us along this project. I want to thank Melissa and Aisha, and then Emily and Megan for um, just helping us build our careers and kind of grow as professional researchers. Yeah, and all the interns for making it an incredible summer. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions for John? And, oh, uh, I see a hand. Is that Doug? Oh. <laughs> Good talk. You organize data centers? What? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> organized data centers. They, they organize the warehouses, so. No, I have another question, but it's also comical. Is RC for real cheap planes or what? Exactly. Really? That's it? I, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just remote control, but. Oh. Uh, <laughs> also, yeah. also real cheap. Real cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So with the um, the TLS at the, the end of the summer, was that, um, did you have a particular goal for that or was it? I mean, do we need to scan the, was it just for fun to scan the building yeah, or learning? Employed graduate students who <laughs> recently graduated. So, um, and it was like to get, there wasn't a direct, like, we want to create a model because other people have done that at the building. So it was more just kind of acquiring a skill and 
um, having competence with it. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think um thank you. Thanks to all the use of interns. <laughs>